The title of this series is Three Cosmic Messages, Earth's Final Conflict. If you've been with us each presentation, we've been unfolding the prophecies of the book of Revelation, particularly Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 to 12. Let's suppose that you live quite a distance in the country and that there's a narrow road coming to your dwelling. Let's suppose there's a river and a bridge that you have to go over to get to your dwelling, to your home. Your son at 17 has just gotten his driver's license. It's a dark, rainy night. Your boy is not home. You get word that the bridge is out. You get word that there's trouble on the road. What's your first instinct? Well, it's to text him, to let him know, right? Or to call him immediately on the telephone. Will he resent that warning? If the bridge is out, he certainly wants the warning. In the book of Revelation, God appeals to us in love. But there also are some warnings. Because in the future, there are some bridges out that God wants us to be able to span that river of error that flows and understand his truth. And he wants us to get home. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you have that great longing to bring us each home. You have that great longing to get us from earth to heaven. And like a loving father who wants his son home on a dark, rainy, stormy night, you want to take us through the storm, across the river of difficulty, and get us home. And we thank you that you've given us messages in the book of Revelation to do just that. In Christ's name, amen. My topic during this presentation is Satan's final deceptions. The book of Revelation unmasks the plans of the evil one and it reveals the plans of God. On a gorgeous September morning in Chicago, a chilling story began to emerge. A young woman, Mary Kellerman, woke up that morning with a terrible headache. A brief history of what happened was recently written by Dan Fletcher. This young woman's name was Mary Kellerman. Because she had a headache and symptoms of a cold, her parents gave her Tylenol when she woke up. Four hours later, 12-year-old Mary Kellerman was dead. The parents were absolutely devastated. But that was just the beginning that September morning in 1982 in Chicago. Not long after that, a postal worker by the name of Adam Janis also died soon after taking Tylenol. Before the day was over, the death toll began to grow. In fact, in a few days, it had grown significantly. The only link being that each victim had taken extra strength Tylenol. Now, when the police began to look into this, when the experts in chemistry began to look into it, they found that these Tylenol capsules were produced in different plants. They were sold in different stores. Their only conclusion is that somebody was tampering with these Tylenol capsules. Their only conclusion was somebody was lacing them with potassium cyanide poison. The city and nation was in panic. Upon testing, each of the capsules proved to be laced with potassium cyanide at a level toxic enough to provide thousands of fatal do doses. Some madman, some maniac, some insane person was tampering with those capsules. There was a nationwide panic. The Tylenol capsules and Tylenol was recalled from stores costing the manufacturer millions and millions of dollars. The police went through the streets of Chicago with a loudspeaker announcing to people, if you have Tylenol on your shelf, discard it, throw it away because it's laced with poison. As I read this very tragic story, this thought came to me. The people that took these capsules actually thought that they were taking something that would benefit their health, something that would reduce the fever, 
something that would reduce the headache. They thought they were taking something beneficial, but yet they were taking a poison that would lead to death. Could it be possible that in the generation that we live in, could it be possible that in this generation there is a spiritual type of laced Tylenol capsules? You say, what are you talking about? Could it be very possible that we're taking a spiritual poison that we think brings us life, but it's actually false doctrine, the wine of Babylon that Revelation speaks about that indeed is fatal. The Bible says in Proverbs 16, verse 25, don't miss this text, there is a way that seems right to a man. What does the way seem? It seems right. It seems proper, but its end is the way of death. Somebody says, well, isn't sincerity enough? You can be very sincere, but in actual fact, you can be sincerely wrong. If I'm driving on a foggy night and there's a bend in the road and I keep going straight off a cliff, I may be very sincere, but it may end up in death. So God's word informs our thinking. It's more than sincerity. It's the sincere desire to know truth in God's word. If our hearts are honest before God, Jesus, in fact, said to the people in his day in John 7, verse 17, he said, if any man will do my will, he will know of the doctrine. So sincerely desiring to do God's will and opening the scripture, the Holy Spirit reveals to us what God's will is. But we may be ever sincere, but trusting in our own opinion, trusting in church leaders, trusting in a religious political organization that the Bible calls Babylon. The book of Revelation reveals God's plans and it exposes error in the last and final generation. God's end time message is being pictured as being carried by three angels in midheaven. The first angel flies and the Bible says, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel. That first angel has the gospel of God's goodness, the gospel of God's grace, the gospel of God's mercy, the gospel of God's life-changing power. That first angel reveals that there's nothing we can do to save ourselves, that salvation is totally in Jesus Christ. That message is to go to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. But the angel emphasizes aspects of the gospel that have been long neglected by Christianity. The angel says with a loud voice so all the world can hear, Fear God and give glory to him. Fear, respect, obey God. Give him glory in your lifestyle, in that which you take into your body, that which you eat, that which you drink, in what you see, what you listen to, the places you go. So this message of the first angel is a call to obey God because we're saved by grace. It's a call that our lives reflect a commitment to God. Why? because the hour of his judgment has come. We're living on the knife edge of eternity. We're living where the sands of time are running out of that hourglass of time, living just before the coming of Christ. And then the Bible calls us in an age of evolution, in an age of dehumanization of human beings. It calls us back to worship the creator, back to the sanctity of life. That's the first angel's message. It's a big message, a message to all mankind, a message that has the foundation of all the biblical truth in it, a message of the gospel, a message of obedience, a message of the judgment, a message of the second coming of Christ, a message of the sanctity of life, a message of worshiping the creator. But then the second angel flies and he says, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. As we have studied, God is calling us to live godly lives in the light of the judgment hour. He's calling us to have nothing between our soul and our Savior. He's calling us to decision in this hour of earth's history. But then that other angel does fly in Revelation 14, verse 8. It says, another angel flied, saying, second angel's message, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city because she's made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. We introduced this second angel's message in our last program, our last presentation. 
we pointed out that Babylon represents a false religious system. Revelation 17 describes a woman riding on a scarlet colored beast. This woman is dressed in purple and scarlet. In the Bible, a woman represents Bible prophecy. We find that in Jeremiah 6 verse 2 and Ephesians chapter 5. The true woman is the bride of Christ. The fallen woman is one who has left Jesus united with the state powers. So the woman, the fallen church, rides upon the state. She has Babylon the Great written on her forehead. In our last presentation, we noticed that the term Babylon represents an apostate religious system that distorts truth, substitutes man-made theories for the teachings of the gospel. We understood that the word Babylon means confusion, confused religious values, human opinions substituted for the word of God, human opinions substituted for divine truth. We continue unfolding the mystery of Babylon the Great in this presentation. In Daniel chapter 7, verse 17 and 23, the Bible talks about beasts and symbolizes them as kingdoms. Those great beasts, which are four, are four kings that arise out of the earth. The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom on the earth. So when we read in Revelation 17 about Babylon, the mother of harlots, we read about a great mother church dressed in purple and scarlet. We pointed out in our last presentation that that great mother church sitting on the seven-hilled city was certainly the Roman church. She directs state powers. In the last days of earth's history, church and state will unite. Religious liberty will be undermined and religious liberty will be something that is usurped by these state powers. But there are two central pillars of Satan's strategy to lead to this union of church and state that we want to take a very careful look at in this presentation. These two central pillars come directly out of Babylon. They're part of Mystery Babylon the Great. Babylon, of course, represents religious confusion. What were the two prime pillars of Babylon? What was Babylonian religion like, and how will that be translated into spiritual Babylon? Now remember, Revelation 18, 2, Babylon the Great is fallen, is fallen, become the habitation of demons. So habitation of demons, that has to do with spiritualism. That has to do with the working of evil spirits, a prison for every foul spirit, a cage for every unclean and hateful bird. So ancient Babylon was the center of spiritualism. The spirits were feared by the people. They believed in the reincarnation of the dead. When the dead lived, they lived on and would come back in another form. Babylon was the center of immortality. It was the center of the idea that there was this kind of immortal essence, this immortal part of an individual. We might call it the immortal soul. That was indeed part of Babylon's philosophy in it. They believed that when a person died, they actually lived on in immortality and at times they could return. Um, ancient Babylonians believed that at death, the disembodied spirit descended into the netherworld. So that's why they worship these images because they believed that they were images or incarnations of those who had died or the gods actually, and they believed that they were worshiping those gods. The idea when you die, there is an immortal soul that continues eternally. This may surprise you. It doesn't come from Christianity. You say, where does this idea come from? The Greeks popularized the concept of the immortal soul in the writings of Plato and Socrates. And so they believed that at death there was a soul that, that left the body. It was, came from Greek philosophy, but where did they get it from? They, of, source, of course, got it from Babylon. When you go back to Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 13 and 14, there are women who come to the temple of God and they've accepted these Babylonian ideas. They've actually slipped into the church, slipped into ancient Israel. 
And uh, notice what the prophet says. He said to me, turn again and you will see greater abominations. Now, these are abominations that come into Israel, the church. They're Babylonian teachings that they are doing. So he brought me to the door of the north gate of the Lord's house. And to my dismay, you can imagine how the prophet was dismayed when he saw this. Women were sitting there weeping for Tammuz. Now here in Israel, in the temple of the Lord's house, you have Israelite women that are weeping for who? Tammuz. Now who was Tammuz? Tammuz was one of the Babylonian gods, the Babylonian god of vegetation. And what did the Babylonians believe? They believed that when their god died, in, when the winter came, be, that um, the winter would darken the sky and there would be long nights. That would indicate the goddess of vegetation, Tammuz, had died. They then believed that when spring came, there would be a resurrection and Tammuz would live again. So they had this whole idea of immortality, that when you die, you don't die, the dead really live on. Now, why would Satan use that as one of his major pillars in ancient Babylon? And how would the immortality of the soul come into Christianity as one of Satan's pillars? What's Satan's strategy and all that? Satan's strategy is precisely this. If you can get people believing in immortality, if they believe that the dead who've died can come back, they will be captured by evil spirits and their minds will be led from the clear teachings of the Bible to the teachings of these evil spirits. So that's part of Satan's strategy. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 5 tells the biblical concept of death. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. So in the Bible, when God created the human race, he created Adam out of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, the life-giving power of God, and man became a living soul, a living creature, a living being. The Bible does not say God put a soul into man. The soul is the product of the body God created and the breath of life. When a person dies, what happens? The Bible says, Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7, when a person dies, the body goes to the dust and the spirit, that's the life-giving force of God, not something that thinks, not something that reasons, goes back to God. So the soul is the product it is the result of God breathing his breath into human beings, forming the body. It's the result of that. Another word for soul is a living being. Sometimes a person goes to the grocery store, they get their tasks done much more quickly, and they come back and they say, was well, not a soul there. What did they mean? There was not some conscious being there? Not at all. They mean there's not a person there. The living know that they shall die in the Bible. Death is but a sleep, and the dead don't know everything. They know nothing. In a sermon called, Is Man by Nature Immortal? by Amos Phelps, a great Protestant preacher of a couple of generations ago, he traces the idea of the immortal soul very powerfully. He says, this doctrine of the immortal soul, can be traced through the muddy channels of a corrupted Christianity, a perverted Judaism, a pagan philosophy, a superstitious idolatry to the great instigator of mischief in the Garden of Eden. The Protestants borrowed it from the Catholics, the Catholics from the Pharisees, the Pharisees from the pagans, and the pagans from the old serpent who first preached the doctrine in the lowly bowels of paradise to an audience all too willing to hear and heed the new and fascinating theology, you shall not surely die. What did Lucifer say to Eve when he came to the garden? He said to her, you shall not surely die. You are naturally immortal. There's an essence in you that's immortal. You can take of this fruit and you will not die. So the idea of the immortality of the soul, the idea that death is not death, the idea that you know more in death than you did in life, that comes not from Christianity, 
but it's one of the Babylonian teachings that comes right from the Garden of Eden in Satan's word that you shall not surely die. The devil uses that in the last days of earth's history as one of the points of deception. Revelation 16 verse 14 says, they're the spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. What is the battle of the great day of God Almighty? It's the battle of Armageddon. This final conflict between good and evil. This final conflict between Christ and Satan. This final conflict where church and state unite and all the forces of hell are focused upon God's people to destroy them. But what is it at a time of crisis? What is it at a time of economic disaster? What is it at a time of political disaster? What is it at a time when the entire world seems uncertain and falling apart? What is it that brings the world back to this unity? It is the spirits of demons working miracles through false religions to unite the kings of the earth in a power block to oppress the people of God and try to bring world unity in one great world unification approach. You see, why is it that this idea of the immortal soul, what does this do? How does it impact practical Christianity? Well, the pagans, the Babylonians, would bring offerings for the dead. And they would come there to the shrine of those that died. And in some world religions, that's true today. In Buddhism, this certainly is true, where offerings are brought for the dead. This is true in a number of world religions today. Why is this one of Satan's central pillars? We pointed out first because it becomes a counterfeit revelation of truth and it leads people from the objective truth, the clear truth of the word of God. But also, these offerings become a substitute of a heart commitment to Jesus. And the spirits of the demons become substitutes for the one redeemer of our world, Jesus Christ. There is only one offering, and that's the offering of Jesus. He's already made that offering. So we need not come with the offering of our works, our righteousness. We need not come in fear trying to make ourselves right with God. We come to God through Christ. We come with the one who says, Him that cometh to me, I'll no wise cast out. We come in deep commitment to the one who says, Come unto me, the gentle, loving, compassionate Christ whose grace flows from his heart, says, come unto me. So we need not come with offerings for the dead. Revelation chapter 14, verse 13 says, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. The book of Revelation is very, very clear. The dead rest from their labors. As the book of Job says, they shall never return to their house again. They rest. Fifty-three times the Bible says death is but a sleep. In the Bible, death is a rest. When we die, we rest from the calamity of life. We rest from the pain of these physical bodies. We rest from the distress that occurs here in this life and all of its pain and suffering. We rest. You know, when you go to sleep, you sleep momentarily, and the next moment you know, you're waking up, right? When you go to sleep, if you are in a sound sleep, you don't say, well, it's 10 o'clock and I went to bed, but now it's 11, and your mind doesn't register all of that. Why? It's this perfect total rest. So in Scripture, contrary to the deceptions of Satan that flow through the stream of spiritual Babylon from pagan Babylon. Contrary to that, God teaches us the truth about death. In scripture, death is a rest, a sleep mentioned 53 times until the return of our Lord. And look, why does Satan try to perpetrate this era of the immortal soul? Because he hates the doctrine of the second coming of Christ. See, if the dead already go to heaven, why would Jesus come again? 
to somehow unite dead bodies to, to souls? That doesn't make sense. But the Bible says, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, that should shout of victory with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ those that have been sleeping in Jesus will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Thus we shall always be with the Lord. Imagine this scene. Your father has died. You long to see him again. Your mother has died. You long to see her again. A brother, a sister, a child. But one day, lightning flashes from the east even unto the west. One day the earth shakes with a mighty earthquake. One day the sky is illuminated with the glory of God. And Jesus descends down the court of the time. He says, John, come forth. Mary, come forth. Peter, come forth. Alice, come forth. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. It's the voice of victory. Sin and suffering and heartache will be no more. The devil hates that. So he perpetrates this idea upon the human race. Oh, oh, don't think much about the coming of Christ because there's kind of a soul that's kind of this ethereal, mystical thing that kind of wings its way to heaven. Why do so many churches lack spiritual power? Because the preaching of the second coming of Christ is no more in many of those churches. Many have lost the urgency of the second coming of Christ, but down through the ages. When the urgency of Christ, the second coming, beats in your heart, when you long for the second coming of Christ, you are driven to your knees to a deeper commitment to Jesus and a deeper sense of his love and his grace. Satan has introduced, even to Christianity, a false doctrine from Babylon to undermine the whole idea of the second coming of Christ and to place people's minds in a position to be deceived by spiritualism. The hope of this world, according to the Apostle Paul, Titus chapter 2, verse 13 and onward, he says, he talks about the, we are looking for the blessed hope. There is hope for our weary, war-torn planet. There is hope for a confused, chaotic world. There is hope for a planet of disease and disaster and death. There is hope for this planet, and that hope is in the second coming of Christ. The book of Revelation rings with hope. The book of Revelation is saturated with hope. The book of Revelation and these three cosmic messages beat with the urgency of the second coming of Christ and give us a new hope. Now, there are two central pillars in Satan's strategy. First is spiritualism that comes directly from Babylon. Second is sun worship, whereas spiritualism prepares our mind for deceptions, whereas spiritualism takes us from the reality of the second coming of Christ. Sun worship undermines our confidence in the Creator and leads men and women to disobey the clear command of God that said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Ancient sun worship comes from Egypt, where they worshipped Amun-Ra, the sun god, Babylon, where they worshipped Bel Marduk, the sun god, Persia, where they worshipped Mithra, going on to Rome and the sun god, Eternity Veritas, and so all these pagan cultures worshipped the sun god. Now there's an amazing story that takes you back in the book of Dr. James Frazier, volume 1529, in his book, The Worship of Nature. An amazing story in which he points out that in ancient Babylonia, the sun was worshipped from immemorial antiquity. So the sun became that luminous object in the heavens. And as the pagans looked at this luminous object in the heavens, they believed that when the sun shone in proper proportions, that their crops grew. When the sun, when the sun god was angry with them, he'd burn up the crops. When darkness hid the sun and it didn't rain, the crops would wither as well and die. So they saw the sun as a god, and they worship the sun god. In Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 16, this Babylonian influence from sun worship actually came in to Israel. 
So he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. Now that's uh, right at the temple. And there at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord. Now if your back is to the, toward the temple of the Lord, the temple faces toward the east. So if, you're, if your back is toward the temple of the Lord, what are you facing? You're facing east. So the Bible says, with their faces toward the east, and what were they doing? They worshiped the sun toward the east. Can you imagine it in Israel? Where God said to Israel, in the commandments, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou work into all thy labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. You see, the Sabbath command that God said remember was given in memorial of creation. And here, into Israel, the very people of God to whom were given the very commandments of God for every generation and for mankind throughout its history, slipped into that community this limited amount of sun worship that the devil wanted to impact the entire community with. In every generation, Satan has attempted to exalt the creation above the Creator. And that's why the issue of Sabbath worship is so significant. If you turn from worshiping the Creator, the logical conclusion is to worship the creation. If you turn from worshiping the Creator, the logical conclusion is that you'll worship works of your own hands and the human is exalted above the divine. Sabbath worship calls us back to rest in our Creator to trust in our Creator's love and grace, to trust in our Creator's power, and to be changed by our Creator's strength. It calls us back to rest in His grace, to trust Him completely. Here in Israel, there were those that turned their backs on the law of God, turned their backs on the temple of God, turned their backs on the Creator of, of, that, of heaven and earth, and faced, indeed, the east and worshiped the sun, the principles of Babylon, including sun worship, according to the Bible, would slip into the Christian church during an age of compromise. You say, how in the world could that happen? Let me go back, back to the early centuries, back to history. When the Roman Empire is falling apart, the Roman church is growing in its authority, growing in its power. Jane, John Eddy wrote in the Bible Encyclopedia, page 561, Sunday was a name given by the heathen, notice Sunday, the day of the sun, to the first day of the week, because it was the day on which they worshipped the sun. You see, the sun god was predominant in these pagan cultures. So in the weekly calendar, they named Sunday, the first day, because it was the chief god, Monday, was Moon's Day and so forth throughout their culture. Well, how did this Sunday worship ever slip into the Christian church? Sunday worship came in over a period of time. It took centuries for it to develop, but it came to the forefront, particularly in the days of Constantine. Constantine had a strong affinity for sun worship. Notice this statement by Edward Gibbon, the author of The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, volume 3, page 237. He says, The sun was universally celebrated as the invincible guide and protector of Constantine. So Constantine has this affinity for the sun. The Roman Empire in the days of Constantine is falling apart. By that time, barbarian tribes from the north are coming down. Constantine wants to do everything he can to redeem, to save his empire. Eventually, he moves his capital from Rome to Constantinople. But in an attempt to save his empire, Constantine does this. It's logical then, and this is what Gibbon says, 
that in AD 321, in an attempt to unite his empire at a time of social upheaval, Constantine passes the first Sunday law. Why? Because the pagans are already worshiping the sun god. Christians have now begun to, many of them, to worship Sunday because Christ rose from the dead on that day. Now, the Bible never tells us to worship Sunday because Christ rose from the dead on that day, but some Christians began to drift to be in harmony with the majority of that society. Notice, here's the first Sunday law, A.D. 321. On the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrates and the people residing in the cities rest, and let all the workshops be closed. Now, notice this is not a worship law. It is a law that comes in socially for what Constantine believes is the best of society. But the church, uniting with the state through church councils, establishes Sunday as the day of rest and worship contrary to the Bible. State decrees, church councils eventually firmly establish Sunday as the day of worship in contradiction to the law of God that says, remember the Sabbath day, fourth commandment to keep it holy. Six days shall thou work, labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. God said, remember why? Because he knew that in those early centuries, that compromise would enter the Christian church. Is there historical evidence that this took place and that compromise took place in those early centuries to amalgamate, that is to unite these two festivals together, paganism and Christianity. In the Catholic world, page 809, I read, the sun was a foremost god with heathendom. Our Roman Catholic friends acknowledge what happened. Hence the church in these countries would seem to have said, keep that old pagan name. It shall remain consecrated and sanctified. And thus the pagan Sunday dedicated to Balder, the sun god, became the Christian Sunday sacred to Jesus. So what happened? At a time of crisis, when the Roman Empire was falling apart, Constantine established a social day of rest. Church leaders in church decrees and church councils to bring the empire together and to evangelize the pagans. They had already adopted the vestments of the pagans with the priest wearing often purple and scarlet. They had already renamed many of the pagan images and brought them into the church and named them for the saints, Peter and so forth. Now, in another compromise measure to unite Christianity with paganism and to make it easier for pagans to become Christians, they adopted Sunday. In Alexander Hislop's The Two Babylons, page 105, he says this, to conciliate the pagans to nominal Christianity, Rome, pursuing its usual policy, took measures to get the Christian and pagan festivals of Sunday amalgamated or united. So what do we see? We're seeing the wine of Babylon. We're seeing the images of Babylon come into the Christian church. We are seeing the idea of the immortality of the soul, that the soul lives on, come into the Christian church. We are seeing Sunday worship come into the Christian church. This is contrary to the teachings of God's word. That's why God sends a three cosmic messages. That's why God sends this message of the second angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, my people. Come from its errors. Don't be intoxicated by its wine. Hislop says to get paganism and Christianity now far sunk in idolatry, in this as in so many other things, to shake hands. So what happened in those early centuries, pagan practices, according to history, flooded into the church and paganism and Christianity shook hands. I call you today not to a fusion of paganism and Christianity, but to the pure Bible truth of God's word. God is developing a group of people whose hearts are subject to his word, whose minds are subject to his word. Sunday became a vehicle to unite two religions, paganism and Christianity, in a compromised role to save the empire. 
Dr. Edward Hiscox, the author of the Baptist Manual, spoke and shocked a large group of Protestant ministers when he said, what a pity that it's Sunday, comes branded with the mark of paganism and christened with the name of the Son God, then adopted and sanctified by the papal apostasy and bequeathed as a sacred legacy to Protestantism. Dr. Edward Hiscox, author of the Baptist Manual, understood what happened. He understood that Sunday comes branded with the mark of paganism. God says in Ezekiel 20, verse 12, Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. The Sabbath is a sign. It's a sign of allegiance. It's a sign of, of loyalty to God. It's a sign that we accept God's authority. The Sabbath has been undermined by Satan, who, want, who has wanted to destroy the authority and the word of the Creator God. But God is calling us back. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. The teachings of ancient Babylon, unfortunately, regrettably, have slipped in to the Christian church. God raised up great men of faith, great women of faith, reformers who, have beg who began in the Reformation to lead his people back to the word of God, back to salvation by Jesus Christ and Christ alone, back to understanding the truth of his word. And he's completing that reformation today by raising up a movement, a movement that will indeed lead people back to his word. At a time when according to Ezekiel 22 verse 26, her priests have violated my law, the religious leaders in Israel violated God's law, and it's happening again today, my friend. They profane my holy things. They've not distinguished between the holy and the unholy. And there, for many, the Bible Sabbath is just this common, ordinary day of sports and buying and selling and shopping. They have not distinguished between the holy and the unholy, nor have they made known the difference between the unclean and the clean. In other words, eat anything you want, drink anything you want. See, that's why this message of the three cosmic messages, the message of the three angels is so important. It calls us back to the gospel, calls us back to obedience to God, calls us back to treating our Bibles like the, our bodies like the temple of God and not a fun house. It calls us back to the second coming of Christ in the judgment hour. It calls us away from the polluted doctrines of Babylon. It says, they have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths so that I'm profaned among them. Religious leaders today hiding their eyes from the Sabbath. Where is all this headed? God is saying, come out of her, what? Come out of her, my people. Many of God's people are still in Babylon. Satan's pillars of his strategy, spiritualism to deceive, sun worship, again at a time of crisis to bring the world together again one who wrote with penetrating insight, Ellen White, in the book Great Controversy, page 588, says this, through the two great errors, the two great what? Errors. The immortality of the soul in Sunday sacredness. Satan will bring people under his deceptions. The wine cup of Babylon will be passed out. Church and state will unite. Men and women will be intoxicated with the false doctrines of Babylon, the false doctrines of the immortality of the soul, which will prepare them for the deceptions of spiritualism that will take the world captive. Sunday worship, which like in the early days of the Roman Empire, was a vehicle to unite church and state and the world. That will come again. Notice this statement goes on. While the former lays the foundation of spiritualism, that former is the idea of the immortality of the soul. The latter, that Sunday worship, creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. The Protestants of the United States will be the foremost in stretching their hands across the Gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. They have no protection because they accept the immortality of the soul. They will reach over the abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power. And under the influence of this threefold union, what's the threefold union? 
spiritualism, Protestantism, Catholicism. This country will follow in the steps of Rome and trampling on the rights of conscience. What happened in the days of ancient Babylon? Nebuchadnezzar established a counterfeit image. He passed a decree compelling worship, and those who did not bow down faced severe penalty of death. In the last days of earth's history, just before that happens, God's clarion call is going out to the world. His messages are going out to the ends of the earth. This gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of truth, must be preached to the ends of the earth so that men and women will fully understand the issues before the second coming of Christ. The message will go out of the second angel in Revelation 14 8. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Come out of her, my people. Church and state will unite. Falsehood will prevail. Demons will work their miracles to deceive. The world will be catapulted into its last final conflict. But we are secure in Jesus. We have our confidence in Jesus, not in man-made creeds, not in human ideologies, not in the ideologies or teachings or traditions of men. In Christ we are secure. In Christ we find our refuge, as it says in Psalm 46, 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. When all of this world is in chaos and confusion, when the greatest time of trouble in the history of the world comes, we find security in Christ. We find our refuge in Christ. We find our hope in Christ. We find our confidence in Christ. We find our protection in Christ. We find our strength in Jesus. This message of the three angels is given by a God of love, a God wants, who wants you with him, a God who does not want you to be deceived in the last days of earth's history. God is leading us today back to his word. God is leading us today back to his truth. God is leading us today to a fuller, deeper, more complete understanding of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. You may be a Christian committed to Christ and you've never heard these things before, but you hear the message of truth, a message that is not being preached, has not been preached in your church, a message of the three angels, a cosmic message to prepare men and women for earth's last conflict. Your heart responds, it's time to step out. Maybe you've heard these things before. Maybe you're an Adventist Christian but you've been sitting in the pew, you've been complacent, laid to see, and, but you sense that there is a message for your heart and God is calling you. He says, sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. God's appeal is for a group of people who believe that you can come directly to Jesus without a lifeless image as an intermediary. God's appeal is for a group of people whose hearts long for Christ and who came once, but he's going to come again to take them home. God's appeal is for a group of people who adore him as creator of heaven and earth and worship him on the Bible Sabbath. The world is drunk with Babylon's false doctrines. And in Revelation chapter 18, verse 2 and 4, we read, And he cried mightily, with a loud voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people. With gentle tones, Christ appeals, come out of her, my people. Jesus' people are in Babylon. Jesus' people have drunk of the wine of Babylon, and he loves them. And with tones of tenderest love, he makes that appeal, come out of her, my people, lest you share her sins, lest you receive of her plagues. What is sin? It's the transgression of God's law. So God calls us from every law-breaking church. As it says in the commentary of Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown, in every apostate world-conforming church, there are some of God's invisible people, his true church, who would, if they be safe, must come out. That's the appeal to your heart right now. Come out of her, my people. 
come out of the false ideology of Babylon. Accept the pure truth that comes from God's word. Come from every man-made teaching. Come to Jesus. You say, I've followed Jesus before. He has something deeper for you. He has another step for you to take. You are one of his people. He identifies you as one of his people. Nearer, still nearer. Close to my heart. Jesus is drawing you right now nearer. God is inviting you to take a step closer to him today. He's inviting you to make an eternal decision in your life right now that you are going to follow his will. Will you do that as we pray? Lord, give us the courage to help us to step out from the majority. Give us the courage, if we're already Christians, to help us step out from the complacency of popular church religion. Help us have that passion to follow you and give us the strength and courage to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus invites you to have a blessed day.